Hey everyone. Earlier in the semester, I planted some ideas in your minds about voice that I hope have been able to take root. More importantly, I hope that they get to flourish on successive drafts of your research article in which you will walk the tightrope of including both your own unique voice into your article while also adhering to the demands of an academic readership. If you recall, I introduced the idea of rhetorical dexterity, a term coined by Shannon Carter, to describe the skill of adjusting the language that you use in order to most effectively address the audience that you wish to reach. Carter describes it more specifically as using the communication tools in one community of practice to communicate with another. The term community of practice is just a way of talking about groups of people with a shared language. Think of a sports team or plumbers or musicians. Each of these groups has its own special language and members of the group can tell if you're in or out of the group based on your ability to use that language. Academia, colleges and universities, has its own communities of practice. Your major, whatever it is, likely constitutes a community of practice. Using the language of that community will be key to your success in it. Much of the work of this class is to engage you directly in learning and mastering some of the tools of that community. Our text, They Say, I Say, speaks to this directly, providing you with templates that mirror the common modes of communication in college writing. I'd like to tie this idea as well to ethos, the ethical appeal. You want to prove to your reader that you're believable, that what you say is relevant and that it matters to them. You want to prove to be a reliable source. One of the ways you can prove this is with the language that you use. If you recall, early in the semester, we did an exercise in which we looked at different readings and decided whether they were casual, informal, semi-formal, or formal. And although there were some gray areas, we were able to categorize different texts into these categories. Broadly, to appeal to an academic audience in the type of paper I'm asking you to write, you should shoot for somewhere between the formal and semi-formal mode. It will be a major strike to your ethical appeal if you're writing extremely casually. The reader will see you as outside of the group that you're presuming to be a part of. A look back at the slide describing the modes shows the following definition for the formal mode. Quote, precise, impersonal, follows standard English rules, unquote. It describes the formal mode as being used for most academic, technical, or business writing. The definition for semi-formal goes like this, quote, follows English rules, but can be casual at times. The slide provides the examples of magazine features, professional blogs, and much newspaper writing. So basically, that means that your audience will expect proper grammar, adherence to guidelines such as those of MLA, the expression of sophisticated ideas, and clarity of expression as aspects of your writing. Use of these will all make you appear reliable to your readers, like you're in the group. And for some of us, we may feel that our own voices may be drowned out by these demands and formal guidelines. But I want you to know that this is not true. That there is a place for you to express your own ideas using your own unique voice in academic writing. You can show a degree of formality and a knowledge of the rules and use words that you would use. Speak plainly and develop ideas in a way that mirrors your own thinking. Think about Anzal Dua's comments at the beginning of How to Tame a Wild Tongue. We talked about how she moves among these different registers to reach her audience. In one sentence, she talks about, quote, being caught speaking Spanish, a rather informal turn of speech. But by the end of the section, right at the beginning of her paper, she lays a rather formal sentence on us. Quote, Attacks on one's form of expression with intent to censor are a violation of the First Amendment. Unquote. She's reminding us of the formal language of the law in order to make her argument. In her essay on voice, Susan Orlean tells us that, quote, Developing a writer's voice is almost a process of unlearning, one analogous to children's painting. Young children often create fabulous paintings, only to be told after they start school that real houses don't look that way. 
unquote. She goes on to say that, quote, your identity and your self-understanding become subliminal parts of your writer's voice, unquote. It's important to note that your paper, and in particular your ethical appeal, will get better if your identity and self-understanding are evident in the words that you choose to use and how you choose to use them. So there's a balance between the formal demands of readers and the uniqueness and individuality of your own voice that you have to navigate. This is the tightrope walk I referred to at the top of this presentation. Check out Chapter 9 in the fourth edition of They Say, I Say for some valuable lessons on this. The title of the chapter itself will provide insight on its point. It's called, You Mean I Can Just Say It That Way? Our editors go on to argue, on page 118 of the fourth edition, for those following along, that, quote, Mastering academic writing does not mean completely abandoning your normal voice for one that's stiff, convoluted, or pompous, as students often assume. Instead, it means creating a new voice that draws on the voice you already have, unquote. This resonates with something George Orwell said in one of the most famous essays about writing, Politics in the English Language. In it, he provides six rules, the second being, quote, never use a long word where a short one will do, unquote. I often find students under the impression that the opposite is true. So keep that in mind. Back to the editors of They Say, I Say Now, who further assert that, quote, Academic writing is often at its best when it combines what we call everyday speak and academic speak, unquote. The editors give this example from Judith Federley, where she translates a phrase in academic speak into everyday speak. Here's the Federley quote. As Merrill Skaggs has put it, Willa Cather neurotically controlling and self-conscious about her work, but she knows at all points what she is doing. Above all else, she is self-conscious, unquote. Without question, Cather was a control freak. That's Judith Federley's last comment there. So you see how she takes the formal quotation from Meryl Skaggs and breaks it down into the everyday phrase, control freak? It sounds smart, but it also reminds us that there's a human behind those words. It's a sound move, so maybe you can find ways to consider it yourself. Also, a note on form. Notice how Federley uses another writer's voice. She introduces the quotation with her own words. And after she quotes the person, she comments on the quote. That's something that's sometimes called a quotation sandwich. Much of the time, when you introduce another writer's voice into your argument, you should do it in this manner. Your words, the other person's words in quotation marks, and then your commentary. Also, be sure that you're familiar with MLA guidelines for in-text citations. So, while revising your papers, one thing your judge might think about is where in this continuum of formality your writing currently lies. And if it's too academic sounding, think about breaking down stiff sentences. And if it's too everyday, try to find ways to make it more formal. The more that you can show off your rhetorical dexterity, that your audience is both regular people and people in the academy, the better your research article will be and the wider an audience it will reach.